Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us today. Uh, this webinar will be on Washed Ashore, Combining Art and Science, Two Ways of Raise Awareness of Plastic Marine Debris, uh, presented by Patrick Chandler. I'll hand the speaking mic over to him in just a second. Uh, until then, I just wanted to tell you guys a few quick things. Uh, number one, if you go to the handout section on the GoToWebinar control panel, you'll notice that there is a PDF for you to download. Uh, you all want to download that as soon as you can. And then also, please be sure to have a pen and paper handy for a few short exercises during the webinar. Uh, you'll also see in the GoToWebinar control panel that there is a uh, questions panel. If you click in the questions panel there, you can ask us questions on the back end. Uh, so anything you come in will come to me, uh, and then you can, uh, we'll relay those to Patrick at the end of the webinar. Uh, if there's any like short substantive, you know, please repeat that, provide a little bit more clarification questions, we can relay those right away. Um, but anyway, thank you all for joining us, and I will hand the microphone over to Patrick. Hello, everyone, and thank you for being here today. I'm looking forward to introducing you to the Integrated Arts Marine Debris Curriculum that uh, I've spent about the past year and a half working on for Wash to Shore. But before we jump right into the curriculum, I want to talk a little bit about marine debris and the Wash to Shore project. One of the main goals of the project and my work and of the curriculum is to increase the number of conversations that people are having about this issue. And in order to facilitate that, I think it's really helpful as people who talk a lot about marine debris, as I know many of us do, that we're able to articulate what we want to share about it. So before we jump in, I'd like you to take a moment to write down your top three marine debris talking points as they are right now, just to kind of check in with yourself on where you're at with marine debris communication. So these are the three points that if somebody came up to you and said, tell me about marine debris and what that's all about, you'd want them to walk away from that conversation knowing these three things. So we'll take about just uh, 30 seconds here. And um, yeah, go ahead and write down those talking points. Just a few more seconds here, finish up your thought. No worries if you didn't have a chance to finish all three points, but if you are a marine debris educator or are part of an organization that communicates about marine debris, I would really encourage you to do this exercise with your staff so that everybody is on board for what you'd like to communicate. And I didn't think it was fair to ask you to do that without sharing my three talking points with you here. So let me see if I can get my PowerPoint to work. OK. My first talking point is that marine debris is causing great harm to an ecosystem that we are all connected to. And whether you're living on a coast or not, by virtue of being in the world, you're connected to the ocean, through the food that we eat, the air that we breathe, through the economies of our nations. In so many ways, we're connected to the ocean. And one of the biggest ones that leads to marine debris is the fact that the ocean is downhill from everywhere, so that no matter where we're at, the water around us eventually can reach the sea. So that's the first point, that we're all connected to the ocean. Second point is that most of the marine debris that's collected each year is made up of single-use plastic. These are the, uh, the numbers from the 2015 International Coastal Cleanup. And 
they vary a little bit from year to year, but for the most part, the types of things that make up the bulk of what's found are single-use plastic. And they're coming from land. Marine debris, about 80% of it, is coming from land into the ocean. And I think one of the most important things when you get to talking to people about this issue is leaving them feeling empowered um, and giving them an action that they can do in order to affect the problem um, and reduce marine debris. So my point on that is less plastic on land leads to less plastic in the ocean. The hopeful thing about having the uh, number of single-use plastics that we do reach the ocean is that we have the ability right now to choose alternatives to those items. And um, through our consumer habits, through the choices that we make every day, we can reduce the plastic that reaches the waste stream and therefore reaches the environment. I also want to check in on some of the current research just so we're all on the same page with what's going on with marine debris right now. These three studies, to me, kind of sum up the current status of marine debris in the ocean. We know that around eight or nine million metric tons of uh, plastic trash gets into the ocean every year. And that's pretty staggering. The next study highlights how much floating debris uh, is estimated to be there. And you'll notice that number 270,000 tons is a lot less than the amount estimated to reach the ocean every year. And this study was done over a number of years, compiled data from a lot of different sources, and they were pretty shocked by how low that number of tonnage was. And this really led to the question, okay, where is all of it going? And it helped to further show that the problem of marine debris isn't about you know, floating islands of trash. It's much more complicated than that. We're just starting to understand how much marine debris is ending up on the ocean floor and affecting benthic environments. We know that what's entering the ocean, even if it starts floating, doesn't stay floating for long. It accumulates uh, algae and other living things and gets weighed down and sinks. It breaks down through photodegradation and uh, loses the surface area that helped it float and sinks, washes up on beaches. But the amount of small particles in the ocean is increasing by orders of magnitude. So. There's a lot of plastic in the ocean. It's spread throughout the entire water column. And at this point, there is marine debris in every ocean and in every marine environment. There's a lot of different studies looking at how this marine debris is affecting um, animals in the ocean. And there were some pretty startling publications having to do with seabirds eating plastic estimating that in the coming decades there will be almost no seabirds that uh, don't ingest plastic. Um, and another one that came out looking at the fact that currently over half of all sea turtles have ingested plastic of some kind. But this is the one that really got me. The fact that we're starting to see evidence of zooplankton eating plastic. So marine debris has entered the base of the ocean food chain. And this conversation about which animals are and are not affected by plastic pollution in the ocean, it's really no longer going to be a discussion in the next few decades because every species in the ocean, either directly or indirectly, will be affected by our trash. So that's where we are. And that is a lot to take in. And that brings me to the Wash to Shore project. One of the most important things to consider when you are talking about issues that um, don't feel like they have solutions at hand is how we can find 
creative and innovative ways to move forward. Using the language of the arts it opens up the creative and the intuitive and the emotional part of the brain. And those are the areas that are absolutely necessary to solve the problem of marine debris and also the other environmental issues that we're currently facing. If we take the situation as we see it now and consider that the inevitable future reality, it's pretty hopeless. But through opening up that other side of the brain, the creative and the imaginative, we can recognize that we have completely recreated this world in the past hundred years through the materials that we have designed and the products that we have available, the world is almost unrecognizable. And in the next hundred years, we absolutely have the ability and the responsibility to recreate this world again through making different choices, creating new materials that are eco-friendly. And I believe that um, the language of the arts opens people to those possibilities in a really wonderful way. This is Flash the Marlin, and um, I want to show you a couple of our sculptures so you get a sense of them. Flash is leaping out of the water, and all that foam around his base is created through uh, kebabs made from water bottles. And on Flash's body, you can recognize some bottle caps and some lighters, maybe some other items. We really strive to have our sculptures um, have a lot of recognizable items so that people who see them can recognize things from their own life that were found on the beach and recovered. And ask that question, am I contributing to this problem? And if so, how and what can I do? These sculptures are pretty large. There on the left is Angela Hazeltine Pozzi, the founder of Wash to Shore and uh, our executive director. And the sculptures are, are large and beautiful to bring people in and facilitate conversations. Another important aspect of using the arts to communicate about this issue is that it lets people access this issue on their own terms. Instead of just walking up to them and saying, this is a huge problem and we have to do something about it today and it's causing all these problems, using the arts enable people to go, whoa, that, that's a crazy sculpture. What's it made out of? Oh, these items were found on the beach. I recognize and use these. And by accessing the issue on their own terms, people are more likely to want to seek solutions rather than just shut down and say, that's terrible. I don't want to look at that. I can ignore it. Another important part of Washed Ashore to me is this mission statement. For many years, I was involved in marine debris cleanup and education, and I would go out to the beaches, community cleanups and remote cleanups, and collect as much trash as possible, and then the next year, go and do that again and again and again. There were beaches that we cleaned in Alaska where you could find thousands of pounds of debris on just half a mile of beach every year again and again. And between those cleanups, we would struggle to find the resources to enable those cleanups to happen. And eventually, it got to be really overwhelming to me, and it felt kind of futile. So by looking at this mission and considering the goals of Washed Ashore, I was able to to kind of rethink this issue for myself and recognize that the way that I had been going about working with marine debris was looking at marine debris as if it were the problem itself. And if you look at marine debris as if it is the problem itself, it's very difficult to find solutions. But if you look at marine debris as if it's a symptom of the problem and not the problem itself, if you look at marine debris as a symptom of consumer habits, 
then there is a way forward. And there's action that we can do right now to stop marine debris at its source. So it's very important to me to consider marine debris as a symptom and address this problem through source reduction. The curriculum was designed to help fulfill those goals of source reduction, the items that are most commonly found on the beaches, and using the arts to communicate about these issues. The curriculum is a 12 lesson unit. Each lesson is about 45 minutes long. And it alternates kind of moving back and forth between art and science but um, also integrates both into all of the lessons. I've attached fourth through sixth grade national standards to it, uh, the social studies, language arts, science, and art standards. But I've been piloting the curriculum kindergarten through adult and have had a lot of success with every level, just modifying the language level and the concepts that we discuss. So I would encourage you to use it and to promote it with um, any age level interested in learning about marine debris and using the arts to communicate about environmental issues. There are two main pieces of the curriculum that I felt weren't being expressed in current marine debris curriculum, um, and so I wanted to focus on here. The first that I've been talking about a bit is using the language of the arts to communicate. The idea that the arts are a language that can be learned and used to communicate is really important to us at Washed Ashore. And in this case, we're dealing with visual art. So um, the elements and principles of visual design are, are focused on specifically in a few lessons with the goal of learning a few of them well so that uh, folks can be more intentional, intentional about what they communicate visually. The elements of design on the left there are like the letters of the language of the arts. And the principles on the right are the rules to arrange those letters into words to create the expression that you want to evoke certain emotions. And putting them together really enables you to learn and use this language of visual communication. The next topic that I really wanted to address in this curriculum is looking at plastic as a material. A lot of the lessons that I've seen on marine debris say plastic is bad, it's doing these things to environments, which is true, but they don't start at what is plastic. And I've really found that with most age levels, folks don't have a good feel of that. We take plastic for granted, and it's part of almost every aspect of our daily life. But not many people stop to consider what that means and how that situation happened. So the curriculum also works to establish man-made polymers, what they are, how they've evolved in society, and through that study really bring to light why they have come to be such uh, a part of our lives and our world. And this wouldn't be a wash to shore curriculum if we didn't create a piece of community art that was used to communicate. So in the art lessons, we create two giant masks. These masks are, were made by two classes, so each class made two. And uh, these were the masks we created when we piloted the lessons in Bandon, Oregon, where Washed Ashore is based. Each set of masks is composed of one mask made of single-use plastic items that are similar to the items found on beaches every year and another mask that represents the alternatives to those items. So for instance, the, the plastic mask, the hair is made from braided plastic bags and water bottle kebabs, 
And the alternative mask features hair made from braided cotton. And those are there because in the lesson set, we spend time looking at single-use plastics and considering their effect on the environment. And in lesson eight, we create a t-shirt bag with the students out of an old t-shirt so that they have a tangible alternative to plastic bags that they can go out and use. Um, and then using those materials again in the masks serves as a reminder. The backgrounds to the masks are made uh, on the plastic mask with plastic packaging and um, on the eco mask alternative packaging. And they go back and forth like that, focusing on materials that are addressed specifically in the curriculum and the alternatives to them. The hope is that the masks will be used as communication tools to facilitate conservation and stewardship initiatives in the classroom and the school and the community as a whole if um, schools are up for taking that initiative. Uh, so these masks are doing their work at our Wash to Shore Gallery in Bandon and helping to educate the community here on the type of items that uh, compose marine debris and the alternatives to them that we can choose as consumers. I'm going to jump out of my PowerPoint for a moment and into this Wash to Shore curriculum summary. This is an overview of the curriculum and this is the PDF that um, is available in this webinar and also at, on the Wash to Shore website. But I want to walk you through the lessons so that you get a sense for the curriculum as a whole. The first lesson is an introduction to the Wash to Shore project and to marine debris. And it comes with uh, two PowerPoints that can be used to look at the Wash to Shore process and uh, the issue of plastic pollution. And then the second PowerPoint is a visual scavenger hunt where students can zoom in on the sculptures and find recognizable items and see some of the things that we've collected off the beaches. Lesson two focuses on color and how to use color to um, talk about specific emotions. And we're going to do an activity from that lesson in just a minute. Lesson three is one of my favorites. We actually get a set of, um, a set of substances, uh, glue and borax and cornstarch and water. Uh, sometimes I add in shampoo or other things but get that set of substances and let students jump in to using them to create different polymers using the scientific method. And it's a study of uh, how the, the first plastics started to be developed in society and that race to find new substances and what they could be used for. Um, it's a lot of fun to do with students. Lesson four focuses on looking at biodegradation compared to corrosion compared to photodegradation. We're also going to do an activity from that lesson in just a moment. Lesson five focuses on communicating uh, using texture and how to do that effectively. Lesson six looks at the most common destinations of our trash, including landfills, recycling centers, and the environment, how trash is getting there, and what it's doing once it does get there. Lesson seven is a team building game that uh, I, I really have had a lot of fun with this one as well. It looks at the cycle of trash in our society right now and um, the ways in which we're involved and the habits that we have. Lesson eight focuses on learning about single-use plastics and the alternatives to them. That's the lesson that we create that reusable bag out of a t-shirt. Lesson nine is the first lesson that we focus on creating parts of the giant masks, creating the hair through braiding plastic bags for the plastic mask and cotton for the other masks. We've just made the reusable uh, cotton bag in the lesson before. 
and this is the first lesson where students get to process materials. Up until now, although we've used this collected material set a couple times, um, we haven't cut it or modified it in any way. So students get really excited about finally being able to jump in and um, get the most out of the materials that they've collected. Lesson 10 looks at the evolution of packaging in society. 11 focuses on learning about the mosaic technique to create the background, the skin, for both masks. And, um, and finishing a couple of the other aspects of the mask. And 12 is the culminating activity, which we put the final touches on the masks, create the expressions that they're going to have in order to communicate the messages that we design them to deliver. And then hopefully students can take those masks and use them for a presentation either in the school or beyond. You may have gotten the impression through this overview that uh, this curriculum does require some supplies. So there is a supply list on our website and these items are relatively easy to find. They are composed of um, things that uh, replicate the most commonly found marine debris items and you can ask students to clean them after they've used them and collect them at home and collect them at school or work with a local business to help you collect them there. And there are just a few tools needed for the art lessons. The most important tool in this curriculum is a good set of scissors. Um, so hopefully you can find those for each student. Okay, I want to jump back into the PowerPoint here and actually go through a couple of activities from the lesson set. I'm going to start with an activity from lesson two. This is the introductory activity to that lesson. That lesson focuses on using color to communicate. And it, this is a great way to introduce students to communicating intentionally with the elements of uh, visual design. Because whether or not you're making art, by virtue of living in a visually oriented world, we all make choices about how to communicate visually every day from the way that we dress to presentations that we create and beyond. So um, regardless of whether you're going to get involved into art after this, it's really valuable to think about how to do this effectively. Okay, so thinking about color, I want you to pause for just a moment and ask what you would describe your mood as right now if you had to describe your mood with a color. Think about that for a minute. Next, think about how you would describe your mood when you woke up this morning if you had to describe that with a color. It's been really fun to do this activity with students and I found that almost everybody can do it effectively. And that really shows you that we know something about communicating with color whether or not we do it consciously. Color has a lot of association in our visual world. Um, most colors have some specific associations and these aren't necessarily universal but they're very common. Orange and yellow are bright happy tropical colors. Red is intense and passionate, can have to do with love, can have to do with anger. Uh, black is a formal color and sometimes has to do with death, can be used to darken visual images. Green is about vitality and life. And uh, blue is an interesting one because it can be happiness or sadness and loneliness, depending on the type of blue you're thinking about. White often represents purity and um, can be used to lighten up visual images, and purple is often thought of as a royal color. Looking at color from 
Another perspective here is the artist color wheel where you have the primary colors, red, yellow, and blue, that can't be created through mixing any other colors. And mixing the primaries, you get the secondaries, orange, green, and violet. And mixing the primary and secondary colors, you get the tertiary or intermediate colors. There's some fun things about this color wheel. Any colors in a triangle, you can see the primary triangle and the secondary triangle there, those are contrasting colors. And using two or all three of them really makes an image pop, makes it very visually bright, makes it kind of intense to look at. Complementary colors can be found uh, by looking at colors directly across from each other in the color wheel. So yellow and violet, red and green. And using complementary colors gives an image a very different feel. Helps it feel more in integrated and pop a little bit less. It's a little softer. And then finally, if you choose any three colors next to each other on the color wheel, like yellow, orange, and yellow, and yellow, green, those are analogous colors, and using three that are pretty similar is the softest color set that you can use. Um, I want to take a look at two washed ashore murals here. This is the first one, Sunset Beach, and this is the second one, Tsunami Waves. In these two images, there's not a lot of difference between the colors used. And I've asked a lot of different students to identify which one is the happier image. And almost everybody considers Sunset Beach to be happier. And the only real color difference here is that uh, Sunset Beach uses yellow and orange. And Tsunami Waves um, darkens things up with that black background and uses red. It's fun to consider that. The lines here also give a different feel. Tsunami Waves uses diagonal lines and motion, and Sunset Beach uses horizontal lines that are much more calm to look at. But with this introductory activity, the next thing that we do is gather a set of classroom materials like uh, erasers and paper clips and pencils and pens and classroom manipulables, throw them all into a pile, and then sort them by color. And this is the first lesson where students can really start to see that just by sorting by color and being intentional about it, all of a sudden you, you can communicate more effectively. After we sort those materials by color, we create a face based on a specific emotion using one color and um, do a little gallery showing around the classroom. Okay, so next, I'd like to introduce you to an activity from lesson four. This lesson is based on learning about biodegradation, photodegradation, and corrosion. And the way that I jump into it is by asking students to arrange a set of materials from the one that will take the least time to the one that will take the most time to break down. So go ahead and do that yourselves. These five items are in random order. Please take a moment to write down the order they should be in from the one that takes the least amount of time to break down to the one that takes the most. And I'll give you just a moment to do that. OK, make your final notes here. All right, here is your answer key. When doing this activity with students, instead of doing it as a written activity, actually create a card set based on the how long till it's gone chart that I'll show you in just a moment. And it's a set made of 21 cards, but I always start with these five items. And that's because using these five, you can start to discuss why these materials would be in this order and think about them in terms of how they break down. Biodegradation happens when items are broken apart to be used as food by fungus, bacteria, and invertebrates. 
and it's only able to happen with natural items. Our first two items up there biodegrade. Paper towel is an interesting case because it's already been broken down to a pretty large extent by uh, being blended and pulped and pulled apart. So you can kind of think of it as a natural material that's already been broken down to uh, some degree. Apple core can be eaten by a lot of things in the environment. A plastic bag doesn't biodegrade. There's nothing that will eat it, but it is a pretty thin film. So it breaks down before these next two, the tin can and the disposable diaper. The tin can and the diaper are built to last. Um, metal corrodes, so corrosion is a chemical process that breaks down materials, and rust is probably the corrosive process that we're most familiar with. And this disposable diaper lasts a long, long time, and it's built to do so. Plastics only photodegrade, so they're broken down when the polymer chains within them cross-link under UV light, and they become brittle and start to break apart. So these five items help give uh, a, a way to introduce those processes to students so that students can think about them. The next thing I do in the lesson is introduce five more cards and have students add them into this material set and then jump into arranging all 20 in order if they can get them. And here are those 20 items in the order. I know that this chart and these numbers drive a lot of marine debris educators nuts. <laughs> Understandably so, right? Like, how can you say that these items would take exactly this amount of time to break down? In what environment? Under what circumstances? But I do find that this chart is useful for um, comparing groups of items and comparative breakdown times that those groups take. So if you look at the first one, two, three, four, five, six, seven items on the list, those are your biodegradable items. And the longest that they could take to break down is a few years. And that wool sock can be pretty hardy, but even that, just a few years to break down. The next items on the list are a mix of man-made polymers and metals. Leather is kind of a standout, but um, it's pretty processed and preserved. But for the most part, you can group this chart into biodegradable items and um, man-made polymers and metals. And doing so, talking through this activity with students, having them then arrange the cards into the groups that are biodegradable, uh, corrodable, and photodegradable, really helps them to get a better feel of this issue and why plastic is a problem. Sometimes I even do a, um, a timeline with students, which is helpful because this is the order the items break down in, but something that breaks down in a few weeks is way on the other side of the timeline from something that breaks down in a few hundred years. The last activity uh, for this lesson is to start to consider, after we learn those processes that things break down through, start to consider how different environments would affect those processes. So let's look at a desert and think through, if it takes fungus, bacteria, and invertebrates and life to break down things through biodegradation, are those processes going to happen faster or slower in the desert? A little slower. Corrosion has to do with chemical processes and um, chemical actions happening. And a desert is a pretty static environment. So again, corrosion is going to happen slower there. The photodegradation, though, is going to happen quite a bit faster in a desert. On the rainforest floor, we've got a lot of life. So biodegradation is going to happen faster. A lot of chemical processes and transfer going on on that rainforest floor. So corrosion will also be faster but not a lot of light penetrating to that level, so photodegradation happens slower. And this is the fun one. So in the ocean, biodegradation depends because it'll happen more quickly in places where there's a lot of life and not so quickly in places where there is less life. 
Corrosion happens faster all the time, which you know if you have a boat trailer and have experienced that. But photo degradation depends too. And this is a great way to discuss this topic with students and think about, okay, so if sunlight helps break down plastic, what's going to happen when something's floating on the ocean? It's going to break down into small pieces reasonably quickly um, as compared to how it would in other environments. But if it breaks down into small pieces and starts to sink or gets encrusted with algae and other things, and it sinks below the level UV light can reach it, then photodegradation stops entirely. So thinking through that with students and going about teaching biodegradation, uh, corrosion, and photodegradation through comparison and through thinking through the environments helps students to understand why plastic in the ocean is such an issue and why it lasts so long in that environment. Okay, so this curriculum was piloted in kind of a unique way. The Wash to Shore project is a traveling exhibit, and we also try to make it to a few conferences each year. So I was able to pilot lessons at all of these locations around the country, and at each of them I got feedback from both formal and informal educators and uh, went back to rewrite the lessons and try and make them classroom ready. Um, this helped me to work with uh, a lot of different folks, some on the coast, some not, and helped us to create a lesson set that I think is useful for anyone hoping to teach about the subject. We also piloted the curriculum in Bandon through a summer camp, the summer of 2015, and then through a teacher's workshop last summer, and finally, through an eight-week piloting process at Harbor Lights Middle School uh, this last winter. Some of the challenges to creating this curriculum were creating lessons that were classroom ready. If you have created lessons yourself or been involved in curriculum creation, I bet you have found that issue that because you know a lot about the subject, it's really tempting to put a lot in the lesson but you can only do a few things really effectively in a given class period. So there were a lot of rewrites and revisions that happened to make sure each of the lessons can be accomplished in that 45 minute timeline. Each lesson also has extensions to accommodate the things that we weren't able to fit in that timeline. Um, Bannon's location is quite remote made it a bit of a challenge to haul these materials to all the different places we piloted. I think that in the beginning we really underestimated the time it would require to write and pilot these lessons. Writing them, the first draft, is pretty quick, but actually going through the entire process, it was really good to spend a year and a half on it so that we feel like the lessons that we had published on the website have been thoroughly tested. And finally, um, there are quite a few materials needed to create that community art piece through this lesson set. And um, finding a place to store those in the classroom, hauling them around, was sometimes a bit of a challenge. Definitely uh, surmountable, but um, yeah, that's probably the main challenges that we worked through in creating this curriculum. The last thing I want to do here is show you where you can access these lessons on our website. If you go to washtoshore.org under the Learn tab, down to Resources, click on Resources, you will pull up this page that will lead you to the introductory materials for the curriculum and to the lessons themselves. Okay, well, I hope you all explore these lessons and use them. Don't be afraid to jump in and uh, grab the activities that are useful to you. Don't feel like you need to do the entire lesson set to get something out of it. But um, I hope that uh, you are inspired to try and create those giant masks and use them to communicate in your schools and communities. And if you have any questions, I think we have a few minutes. 
Yes, indeed. Yeah, so if you have any questions, uh, please use the questions panel there in the GoToWebinar control panel. Uh, anything you send in will come to us right away. Uh, <clears throat> we have a few questions in now which we can get to. Uh, but first, I just want to say thank you so much, Patrick, for doing this presentation. Um, also, just to let you know, I'm sorry the handout system is broken. It turns out that a large swath of the internet is down thanks to Amazon's web services being partially out today. <laughs> Perfect timing. <laughs> um, <laughs> so it's going to take us a little bit longer than normal also to get this webinar archived because of the outage. Um, so while you can't download the handout there, if you go onto the Wash Shore website, you can download the handout right from there. Um, so Patrick, uh, first question that came in. Uh, is a question from Lark Starkly about uh, degradation terminology. Uh, so how do you accurately describe the breakdown of plastics uh, in terms of actual degradation and like the plastic completely going away? Absolutely, that's, that's a real challenge. And I think there's a number of ways that um, you can go about it. And that's why we chose to go with that comparative method rather than choosing an exact amount of years. Because it's very difficult to, to talk about, okay, so when you're talking about things degrading, are you talking about how long it takes them to uh, get down to their constituent molecules? What does that even mean? Um, are you talking about getting back to hydrocarbon monomers when it comes to plastic? So that is a very challenging question and one that I don't think has uh, really been resolved. Um, but I think that it is very helpful just to look at the comparative breakdown times of these substances and recognize that man-made polymers take a whole lot longer to break down in any uh, environment than natural items do to biodegrade and that that process of photodegradation is significantly slower, and that if plastics are not exposed to sunlight, that process stops entirely. So I think it is a challenge to talk about what exactly do you mean? Are you talking about uh, these things breaking down to the very underlying molecules or what? But kind of glossing over that slightly to say that no matter how you cut it, when you compare them, I think it's helpful to students to recognize um, comparative breakdown times. Thank you. Uh, so regarding the giant sculptures, uh, do you make those with classes or is that a separate lesson plan? The sculptures take a lot of time and work to make. Those are uh, made through community art. so. In order to create the sculptures, we collect debris off the beach, then we clean that debris up, kind of defunk it so that we can bring it into our workshop. And then it usually takes about six months for a team of community volunteers to create the small pieces that are designed to come together to create the sculpture as a whole. While that's going on, Angela is uh, working on the heads of the sculpture with the artist team and then we bring all those elements together at our um, workshop and, um, and blend them together uh, using our art, art crew. So creating a sculpture is a difficult and um, time-consuming process. Um, it's really not easily accessible to students. So, one thing that you can do, I, I definitely don't want to discourage anybody from jumping in with students to do a marine debris cleanup and creating something from what has been collected through that. Um, there will shortly in the next month be a processing guide posted on that resources page on our website and a uh, curriculum extension uh, funded by the Johnson O'Hara Charitable Foundation in which we do a marine debris cleanup process those materials, and then use them to create miniature versions of the mask we make in this larger uh, curriculum to serve as communication tools for community initiatives. And through the techniques learned in the curriculum itself of intentionally using color, line, and texture, creating patterns, and um, working towards unity and balance, through that, through the processing guide, and through jumping into the extension, I think if you're dedicated to 
creating a sculpture with students, you could take them through that process and um, figure out how to do it. But uh, it's a substantial undertaking um, and takes a lot of forethought to pull off. I would imagine that causes a lot of planning headaches, <laughs> trying to figure out how to get all those pieces together. <laughs> Definitely. Uh, speaking of getting pieces together, uh, do you recommend any types of adhesive for getting the plastics to stick together? Yeah. So this is always a challenge that we have. Um, in creating these giant masks, you have to, we started off by using um, something we use on our larger sculpture set, the buttonhole technique, where you punch a couple of holes in the plastic or material that you're attaching and then push it through the material you're attaching it to and bend the wires around the back kind of like a staple. We found that just wasn't effective in classrooms. It was frustrating students. It was really time consuming. Um, so we had to give that up and uh, move towards using adhesives. Um, there are not a whole lot of things that are really effective to get plastics to stick, but uh, acrylic latex caulking works quite well. We often use acrylic latex caulking with silicone, and using that in a squeeze tube is relatively um, classroom friendly. You can download the MSDS report for that if you're curious about material safety. Um, there's a lot of brands available, and you can use the generic stuff. It costs two or three bucks for a tube. It works pretty well. For the uh, cardboard mask, the earth-friendly materials and the um, packaging alternatives mask there, you can just use normal Elmer's white glue or school glue. Nice. Uh, so keeping on the thread of putting these things together, uh, how do you make the debris not smell so bad? <laughs> well, first of all, for this curriculum specifically, we are using repurposed items that simulate some of the most commonly found marine debris items. So it's not too much of an issue. You can usually rinse them out. But um, if we're actually jumping in with working with marine debris, it depends on the material that you're trying to defunk specifically. Um, netting and ropes take a long time, and oftentimes we just have to let those dry out and work through for up to a year. But for a lot of the stuff that we uh, use, and this will be in the processing guide that will be up in the next month in that resources section, what we do is we soak the debris in uh, vinegar for a good while, sometimes multiple times, give it a scrub after that soaking, and then soak it in um, a peppermint soap kind of bath. And uh, sometimes we have to do that a few times as well. Sometimes it also requires pressure washing, but that's only in the most extreme cases. So um, usually a vinegar soak and a peppermint oil soak and time is the answer. Nice. Um, so can you share any of the feedback you got from students about the curriculum? Uh. Let's see. You know, it, each, each lesson, I think, brings its own, um, its, its own benefits to students and evokes different reactions. And, and some of the lessons connect with specific students. Um, some students are more challenged by the art lessons or the science lessons. But uh, I really enjoyed jumping into the lessons on color and texture and line and helping students to realize how much they visually communicate in their everyday lives. And a lot of the students I worked with, I just did this um, Youth Ocean Conservation Summit in St. Louis and did a number of activities on communicating with color. And the, the kids in those workshops were like, wow, I can use this when I'm creating PowerPoints. I can use this when I'm taking notes for different subjects so that I can choose colors that are specific to how those subjects make me feel. And I just really appreciated watching students learn to use the elements and principles of visual design, not just in art, but um, in their everyday lives. The other thing, it's amazing to watch students start to understand how much plastic is in their lives and in the world and how much they take it for granted. So I got a lot of feedback. One activity is uh, to ask students to track all the plastic that they touch and use for a day. 
um, doing that once at home and then once in school. And kids were just amazed by the amount of plastic in their lives. And I think it really opened their eyes to um, how much we take that material for granted. Nice. Uh, so kind of following through with that, what's like the number one takeaway that you hope students have when they go through this course with you? Doing the full curriculum, the, the number one takeaway I want them to get is, well, it's kind of two, sorry. But first of all, uh, every action does count, and we have the ability as consumers to affect these huge environmental issues. Something I often talk about is the metaphor of community art. With the type of art that we do, we create lots of little pieces and bring them together to make a huge sculpture that will um, give a powerful message about this issue. And it, it's the same with our consumer actions by doing a bunch of little things, whether or not we're able to see it, those actions combine to create a powerful message um, that uh, will make a difference. So our consumer actions make a difference would be one. And the second is that in order to solve these huge problems, in order to find hope and move forward, we need to move beyond just working at these issues from the factual side and the cognitive side. We need to engage them from the emotional side of the brain, from the art side of the brain, so that we can uh, find creative solutions and um, move forward with hope and creativity rather than feeling the great weight of these issues and uh, ending up hopeless. I think we have time for one more question here. And uh, this one is asking if the processing guide covers how to make community marine debris art with your community, uh, i.e., in this case, linking adults and kids together. So again, I, this gets back to some of the questions asked about the sculptures, and I, I wish that there was a, a simple solution to say, this is how you make this happen. But the truth is, we can give you the methods that Washed Ashore uses, which is done quite a bit in the curriculum with those art lessons and with the curriculum extension. We can show you how to process marine debris to make it usable. But the way that you actually go forward and do that, if you want to do a community art project with your community, should be specific to your community. One of the biggest challenges about making art from um, found items is making sure that it doesn't become trash shortly after it's created and just reintroducing it to the waste stream. So it's so important when considering the answer to that question, asking what do we want to use that art for? How do we want to actively engage our community with it? Where is it going to end up? And do we have a plan for that? Also, the art should um, address a specific issue. So do you want to address entanglement? Do you want to in address ingestion? Do you just want to focus on how much plastic we're using and how much is ending up in the ocean? Because for each of those issues, you would want to create something different. So rather than providing a template for uh, do this to make that, we wanted to provide the techniques and procedures necessary so that you can come up with the answer to that question of what will be most effective in your own community um, and do that work there. Nice. Well, thank you so much for this presentation, Patrick, and for having all the guides available. Uh, we will have this archived in a few hours, hopefully, <laughs> on our site, and we'll definitely make sure we link out to the curriculum there so you all can download that. And uh, Great. thank you all for joining us today, and we hope you'll join us with another, another webinar soon. Have a good day, everyone. Thank you, everyone.